We'll notice particularly verses uh, 1 to 5. Mark, would you like to read us those five verses, please? A great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of twelve stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his head. His tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. Thank you. Here's a picture of the birth of Christ, symbolism of the Jewish Christian church, 12 being the number of the tribes and the disciples. The birth of Christ, verse 2, verse 3 and 4, the devil tries to destroy the child, Herod, Pontius Pilate. Verse 5, the child is caught up to God into his throne. Now notice how... The same story is told in an even more symbolic fashion in verses 7 to 12. These are the central verses of the book, 7 to 12. And Mark, would you be so kind as to read us those also, 7 to 12. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth, and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God, and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers, who accuses them before our God day and night, has been hurled down. He overcame, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. Thank you. So here's a picture of the devil who's first a rebel in heaven, but whose ultimate casting down is at the cross as a result of this man-child who's died on Calvary. This is a symbolic way of telling us that Christ has overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil. And then it says, and they, the believers, overcame the devil. Now, this is often misunderstood. I don't overcome the devil by being perfect in all Christian virtues, or I'll never, never overcome him. It says they overcame him how? By the blood of the Lamb. You see, the devil will come to us and say again and again, you're a great sinner. Why should you be a Christian? And your answer, of course, is, but I have a great saviour. He's not a painted saviour. He's a real saviour. He didn't come for painted sinners. He came for real sinners. A bit like General Booth when he started the Salvation Army. He said to the soldiers, go for sinners and go for the worst. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. My answer, when the accuser of the brethren here named, says, Des, hear all your faults and failings. And I don't have time to listen to them all. <laughs> Too big a list, see? My answer is, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses me from all sin. Now, that's how we overcome by the blood of the Lamb. It's not talking about flexing your spiritual muscles, memorizing the whole Bible off, praying all night, and winning souls in such numbers as would make Dwight L. Moody ashamed. <laughs> That's not it. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. Because it works like this. The power of sin is never broken until the guilt of sin has gone. So long as you feel guilty, you can never overcome bad habits. You can ever overcome the world, the flesh and the devil as long as you feel guilty. But when you understand the meaning of the cross, that all manner of sin and blasphemy is forgiven unto men, whoever comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. 
when we see that the reason he died was because of my sins, past, present and future. Now I can silence the accuser of the brethren. You remember Luther told a story like that. The devil presented him with a big scroll. All his sins. And he, in his dream, throws a pot of red ink over the scroll. And then he says, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses me from all sin. So you'll notice in these central verses of Scripture, the very central verses uh, of the whole book of Revelation, we have just read, Mark just read them to us, uh, 9, 10, 11 are the three centre verses. And they're about the casting down of Satan because of the cross of Christ, and it's telling us that the accuser of our brethren can be silenced as we believe in the cross. Now I want you to think briefly on what we mentioned at the close of last session. There's one sermon of Christ in which the roots of this book are found. There's nothing in the book of Revelation that doesn't have its seeds in what we call the Olivet Sermon. The sermon in the last week of his life about the second advent. Found in Mark 13 and Luke 21 and Matthew 24 and 25. Now it's a marvellous sermon. He talks about wars and rumours of wars, famines, earthquakes, pestilences, preaching of the gospel. Talks about all of that. Then he pictures the Son of Man coming in the clouds with power and great glory, all his holy angels with him. He sends the angels to the four corners of the earth to gather together his people. And before that, a terrible tribulation brought on by the abomination of desolation, a name for Antichrist. The fact that he can say the Son of Man will come in glory with all the holy angels with him helps us understand the dimensions of the story that follows of the cross. Who is it that's going to be put on a Roman gibbet? Answer, the one who owns all the angels of heaven. The one who's coming to judge all men. That's who it is they're going to put on the cross. So you see, Matthew, Mark and Luke each tell this same sermon that the man who's about to be crucified will one day come with all the cohorts from above to judge the world. That helps us understand the height, the depth, the length, the breadth of Calvary. This is God. This is God on the cross. Now, the next thing we learn from that great sermon is just as he had great tribulation in Gethsemane, his sweat as it were, great drops of blood, on Calvary, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Despised and rejected of men, all that passed by scoffed him. So his body is to have great tribulation. His body is the church. So the Olivet Sermon, and it's made very plain in Matthew, Mark and Luke, that just before the end time come the greatest tribulation the world has ever known. Now you and I, living in Australia, we say nasty things about our politicians, not as bad as they deserve, but we say nasty things about our politicians. But we have a considerable amount of peace, considerable amount of freedom. Now, many people want to make it very stringent that you must never say anything against the beliefs of anyone else or you go to jail. They're attempting that in America and this country and, and all over the Western world, which means that Christians couldn't preach from conscience. But nonetheless, we think it, it's... it's uh, an enigmatic prophecy, how could there be a great tribulation like Christ foretold? Worse than anything the world's ever known. Let me remind you of one or two things. As soon as there is chaos, the peoples want a dictator. That's how Adolf Hitler got in. When you had to take a wheelbarrow of uh, German coins, marks, to get a loaf of bread. When there was absolute chaos in Germany, they long for a strong hand, and they got it. The story's been true in many of the Western nations. But whenever there's chaos, people look for a strong hand. Dictatorship. And even in a democratic country, when there's fear, funny things can happen. I've just spent 23 years in supposedly the most democratic nation on earth, and I found the people there wonderfully kind, 
wonderfully friendly, wonderfully helpful. We had naught but good, my wife and I, from American people in the 23 years. This is about my fifth trip over there, but it was my longest stay. But the first time I was over there, about the first time, you've heard of Joe McCarthy. Remember the communist threat? I saw Khrushchev. My daughter was on my shoulders watching the, the Russian dictator go through Washington's main street in the 1950s. America was so afraid of the communists, they believed this demagogue, Joseph McCarthy, who accused everybody from Eisenhower down as being communist. And he had America in great fear. Remember they called in even the most public of all people, the Hollywood people. And about 20 of them were put in prison because it was suspected that their writings were somewhat leftist, and some of them probably were. But in America, you're supposed to be able to say what you will. But hundreds and hundreds of people lost their jobs over a communist scare, and many people were wrongly treated because they weren't communists at all. And Joe McCarthy had his way for years. People were afraid to oppose him, lest they be labelled as communists and be put in prison. Even Eisenhower was afraid of him. This alcoholic, this demagogue, this liar did terrible damage in America and put the whole country in fear. Then uh, you should remember that before that, when World War II broke out, many innocent Japanese people who'd only ever lived in the US were corralled, sent away, a type of prison, not an actual prison, but they wrenched out of their homes put where they was supposedly could do no damage. This was very unfair, very unfair. More recently, America has arrested about 1,300 people. I don't mean the last batch, just announced this week. They're being more careful with them because of criticisms. <clears throat> but after September 11, naturally, and rightly so, they want to do all they can to prevent terrorism in the ranks of America, making another September 11. But look what happened. Many people from the Middle East, Middle East were arrested, interrogated, and kept without trial for long periods. Most of them now released. But uh, you wouldn't like it. they have plucked away from family. You work, freedom to go and come, and imprisoned without trial. But it's happened in the most democratic country on earth. And America is a great country. It's great in its badness and its goodness. The worst of everything is there and the best of everything. It's very great. Now I assure you, these little shadows, and they're only shadows, far worse is what happened in the 30s and the 40s in Germany, in Austria, and many of you have seen documentaries or, or movies of the persecution of the Jews. We all know what happened in the Holocaust. You know, at the time of World War I, almost all the professors in the main universities of Europe were Jews. And then comes Adolf Hitler, and we know what happened. The night of crystal glass, they burn the synagogues. The Jewish Jews' shops have signs put up. People can't get work. Oh, it was terrible, terrible, terrible thing to do. Hitler paid for it. He dispatched by his hatred the scientists who invented the atomic bomb that put an end to World War II. And it would have prevented him ever conquering Europe. So it reacted. Now much worse, of course, is what Stalin did. Stalin is responsible, and no one knows exact figures, but the figures range between 30 and 70 million deaths from Joseph Stalin. One in every ten people went to the Gulag. And the Gulag is that chain of Siberian prisons over hundreds and hundreds of miles of Arctic waste almost, where thousands upon ten thousands go and very few returned comparatively. And Stalin was paranoid. In the mercy of God, he had a brain hemorrhage just when he was about to wipe out a group of doctors in Russia because he was afraid they were trying to get rid of him. So if in our time we have seen such examples of paranoia and tribulation... The biblical prediction that the worst tribulation of all is coming is not to be sneered at. It will happen. Now, when Christ gave this sermon, there were certain key words that he used, like watch, 
Over and over again, he gives admonition. Watch. You don't know the day or the hour. Watch. There's coming, you find you sleeping. Watch is a key word of that sermon. Betray is another one. Many will betray one another. He talks about children betraying their parents and parents betraying their children. This happened in Germany. This happened in Russia. This will happen again. Betray. That's another key word of the sermon. Another one, another word that's a key word is hour. You know not what hour your Lord shall come. Watch, betray, hour are three key words of the Olivet Sermon. Now the interesting thing is, in the chapters that follow, those words reoccur in the story of his great tribulation, his passion, his capture in Gethsemane, his trials, his time on the cross. So over and over again you read those words. He'll say, uh, when the soldiers come to take him, he says, this is your hour and the hour of darkness. Or before they come, he prays to the Father, Father, the hour has come. In Gethsemane you can say to the disciples, he is at hand and will betray me. Before he says that, he says to them, look, watch, watch and pray. So watch, betray, hour. The key words of the Olivet Sermon occur in the story of the cross that follows. Now why is that important? Christ is telling us that what happened to him will happen to his body in the last days. When he tells in the second Advent Sermon about the fate of the elect, the great persecution, the tribulation, if it's not cut short, no flesh shall be saved. When he's warning the church what's to happen to it in the final years of earth's history, he uses symbols, key words, of what is about to happen to him. Now what happened to him? If you want to understand the book of Revelation, you need to understand Passion Week. The series of tapes on which I spent more time than any over decades is a series I did on Passion Week. They're available through Good News Unlimited. I spent hundreds of hours on them. But let me give you a synopsis of what they mean for when we study Revelation. One of the clues to the book of Revelation is Passion Week. It begins with the triumphal entry. Christ enters and the world is polarized. As the children cry Hosanna, the Pharisees say we've got to wipe him out or the Romans will destroy us. This man's causing too much upset. So the Pharisees take counsel with their enemies, the Sadducees and the Herodians, and the opposing religious faiths get together, and then, using the betrayer Judas, they link with Pontius Pilate. So you have the Jewish Sanhedrin, Pontius Pilate, hand and glove, to wipe out the man who made the triumphal entry, who by his entry polarised that world. Now, the Bible is trying to tell us that's the way it will be at the end time. As Christ made a final proclamation in the triumphal entry, announced himself for who he was, so the church will make a final proclamation. This gospel of the kingdom should be proclaimed in all the world for witness unto all nations. There are many passages about this. Revelation 18, 1-4, pictures the gospel enlightening the whole earth with glory in the last days. Joel 2, 28-29, predicted. Mark 13, 10 foretells us the gospel must first be preached to all the nations. So as Christ at the beginning of Passion Week polarised that world by his final proclamation of the gospel, the time is coming when the church, and I don't mean a denomination, I mean all true Christians who love Christ, Catholic or Protestant, will be united over the gospel, and in recent years that's happening more and more. You may have heard of evangelicals and Protestants together. Many Roman Catholic scholars now agree with the position of Martin Luther about justification being a declaring righteous. And the Pope has set his seal to that too. So there is a coming unity over the big issue of the gospel. Because the issue of Christianity is not primarily the frills of worship. Music and adoration and praise and ceremonies. The heart of the gospel is the love of God shown at the cross 
manifested in the offer of forgiveness of sins and the gift of the indwelling spirit that we might reflect him to the world. That's the heart of the gospel. So Passion Week presents Christ polarizing the religious world. The religions that hated one another get together and using a betrayer, Judas, now they link with the Roman state to get rid of this thorn in the flesh. It's expedient one man should die, whole nation perish not. So Christ is then thrown into a little time of trouble in Gethsemane where he sweats, as it were, great drops of blood. You imagine the agony that represents. Now, many, many good men have gone to their death without sweating drops of blood. It's not ordinary fear. It's because he's being made sin for us. It's because the weight of the sins of the world are upon him. That's why he sweats drops of blood. He feels he's being separated from his father. He dreads the second death, eternal separation, because of being made sin weight of guilt so he has a little time of trouble then he has trials for the government five times he's silent he says nothing he won't say anything to Herod because John the Baptist has spoken to Herod and Herod had beheaded John the Baptist so Christ refuses to say one word to Herod Pilate asks him seven questions Jesus gives him replies and the last word from Jesus to Pilate is the word sin. He that betrayed me unto you hath the greater sin. Pilate washes his hands instead of exerting them. But he has no way of getting the blood off them and tradition says he suicided some years later. So Christ has a small time of trouble in the garden then he's tried before principalities and powers. And then we see him on the cross. His probation is long closed. He's made his decision, not my will, but thine be done. And now we have the outworking of it where he's forsaken of God because God cannot smile upon the prisoner at the bar. He represented us guilty ones. He is forsaken, so you and I will never be forsaken. You and I can often feel forsaken. We can lose a, a spouse close friend, a job, an ambition crumbles. We often feel forsaken, but we can't be forsaken. God forsook our representative so that we might never be forsaken. So Christ then has this time on the cross, then the hours of the days of darkness, there are three hours of darkness on the cross, representing three days of darkness in the tomb. Then he comes forth in resurrection. Now, that in a nutshell is what Revelation is going to be about. Revelation is going to be talking about the final events when the church will give its last proclamation. It'll be at a time when the world is crumbling. Wars and rumours of wars, famines, earthquakes, pestilences, chaos. You know, Dostoevsky was a great... Christian, he'd been put in the gulag long before Stalin because he's in a group that trying to reform Russia. On his way to prison, a woman put a New Testament in his hand with some Russian rubles in it. And later in the dim light that shone in through the icy atmosphere of the window in the prison, he read the New Testament. And the New Testament's in all the books of Dostoevsky, Crime and Punishment, Brothers Karamazov, uh, The Idiot, these are all Christian books. And there's an epilogue in Crime and Punishment where he pictures the world being infected by a strange new plague. Microbes with intelligence and will are attacking everyone all over the globe and sends people mad. But never before have those people felt so intelligent. So all these people who've got this infection think they're very, very smart. But the trouble is they can never agree on anything. So soon there's war and conflict and the bells are ringing, telling people there's trouble and people come together. They don't know why they've been gathered together. They fight one another. And the whole world ends up in conflagration, famine and death, except for a small family of quiet people who'd never been noticed, not been seen. 
in whose mouth was found no God. So Dostoyevsky is trying to tell us in a novel what he thinks the Bible is foretelling, that the time is coming when the world will go mad. Ultimately, everybody on earth is going to be spirit-filled. Most were the spirits of devils. Revelation 16 says that. The spirits of devils. And a minority was the spirit of God. Ultimately, the world is going to become so chaotic, there will be no unity, no agreement. So they're trying to make an artificial unity by a union of religions with government. It'll have to be a religion of the lowest common denominator, something like the New Age. You know, about one person, perhaps in ten, in the world today is a New Ager. Something like that. What's so attractive about the New Age? Well, it teaches a type of pantheism that all of us are gods in miniature. If so, God gets the flu and has all sorts of embarrassments, if that's true. But the New Age is flattering, see? And you can believe in reincarnation, however been bad you've been here. The Bible doesn't teach reincarnation. I had a brief chat with a man last night who I was walking a lens uh, spoiled poodle. And uh, he said, if I come back, I want to come back like one of those. But there's no coming back. Christ could say about Judas, it's better he'd never been born. This life is his only chance. Today's the day of salvation. Now's the point on. But people in the new age, they take some things from Buddhism and some things from Hinduism and some things from theosophy and so on, put it all together, makes you feel good. Think you're God and, you know, whatever happens, you're coming back and coming back and you're always going to get better. That's not Christian. So ultimately, there will be a union of religion and government, but the religion enforced will not be the religion of the Bible. And if you want to be a Bible believer, you'll stand out like a sore thumb and you'll be hated. You know, Christ said, you'll be hated of all men for my name's sake. We think we should be loved. We don't kill, we don't steal, don't believe in adultery. We should be loved. Christ says, ultimately, you're going to be hated. Now, it seems impossible to anticipate such an event, but I would remind you of a well-known statistic. That only about one in 20 professed Christians ever speak to a non-Christian about Christ in a year. About 5% of the church witness for Christ verbally to a non-Christian in a year. Now, what does that tell us about the church? It tells us what Revelation 3 says. Would you look at Revelation 3 and verses 14 to 20? Here's a picture of the latter-day church, the church of the last days. Graeme, would you like to read to us, please, uh, verses 14 down to uh, 21, please? Here's the message to lay to see, which is a prophetic description of Christianity in the last days. Thanks, Ram. And to the angel of the church, the latest things write. These things, says the Amen, the faithful and true witness for the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither hot nor cold. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich, have become wealthy and have needed nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Thank you. Thank you very much, Graham. Notice what it says in verses 15 to 17 particularly. You're neither cold nor hot. You're lukewarm. You say you're rich. You're increased with goods. Have need of nothing. You know, the income of the biggest Protestant churches in the world, over 90% of the income goes to sustaining that particular church group. In other words, there are 10,000 
churches in America that are independent of any denomination, Protestant or Catholic. And in the majority of cases, 90% of the income goes to fostering the experience of that group. And only a very small amount goes to help the needy world, about 10%. Thou sayest, I am rich, and increase with goods, have need of nothing. That's a description of the church in the last days. So, true Christians today are really in a very great minority. One in every three people on the globe claims to be a Christian. One in every three. It's possible that about one in every 300 is a Christian. So when Christ says, fear not little flock, true Christians are always in a minority and that minority will be hated. Now, let us ask, does Revelation really foretell these things? Look, please, if you would, at verse 10 of the chapter Graham just read. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, he's speaking now to a more true group of Christians, I'll keep thee from the hour of trial which will come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. So here is foretold an hour of temptation, of trial, of difficulty, of trouble, of tribulation that's coming to test everybody on earth. Look at chapter 11. Oh no, chapter 7 first of all. Chapter 7. Verses 13 onward. <clears throat> One of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? Whence came they? I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. He said unto me, These are they that come out of the great tribulation. The great tribulation. Now chapter 11. Verse 7. When they, the Christian witnesses, have finished their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit, Antichrist, shall make war against them, overcome them and kill them. Verse 10, they that dwell on the earth shall rejoice over them, make merry, send gifts one to another. Do you remember what happened when Christ died with Herod and Pilate? When Christ died, Herod and Pilate, who had been enemies, were reconciled together. Here it's saying, the groups on the earth that have hated each other's guts, once they unite against the small company that are trouble creators, because they won't conform, they'll send gifts to one another. They'll be so happy they're getting rid of these people. Now chapter 13, which is the main chapter about Antichrist. The first verses picture this terrible beast using the symbolisms that once were applied to Babylon, Greece, Medo-Persia, Rome. And in verse 5, he speaks great things and blasphemies. He continues 40 in two months. Verse 7, he makes war with the saints. Power is given him over the whole earth. Verse 8, all that dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life. Then verse 11, I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. And he has two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. Now here's a strange symbol. First one's obviously bad. The first beast, the early verses, this chapter. Second one looks like a lamb. Oh, no problem here. Even if you live in Africa and you have to get up at night and you have to go outside and you touch something and you're scared to death, you're thinking of lions and tigers and all sorts of things, and then you feel the wool and you say, oh, it's just a lamb. You're not worried about a lamb. So here it says the second beast is like a lamb, but... It speaks as a dragon and it exercises all the power of the first beast before him. And then it goes on to talk about doing great wonders and verse 14, deceiving people. And verse 15, he has power to give life to the image of the beast. The image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. So here's another beast that first of all looks like a little fluffy lamb that you'd like to cuddle, put a lead around its neck and take for a walk, but it talks like a dragon, and it co-ops with the Antichrist. 
sets up similar image, something like that, and condemns to death all who won't conform, receive this mark or die, that imagery goes back a long way. <clears throat> the greatest crisis the Jews ever had after the Babylonian captivity was what they now commemorate by Hanukkah. If any of you have been in Jewish homes or know much about the Jews, you know that Hanukkah commemorates the victories of Judas Maccabeus and other Jewish heroes after the Syrian king Antiochus had slaughtered 40,000 Jews, this is 165 BC, put an image in the temple which they called the abomination of desolation and said everyone must worship it and everyone had to receive a mark, the sign of the god Bacchus as they worship the abomination of desolation. And people wouldn't receive, and you read about this in the books of Maccabees. You have a Roman Catholic Bible that has first and second Maccabees. Some Protestant Bibles have it. New English Bible often has Maccabees and the Apocrypha. They don't claim inspiration, the Apocryphal books, but some of it's parabolic, some of it's wisdom, some of it's history. And first and second Maccabees are based on history of what happened in the greatest crisis before the first advent. When Antiochus Epiphanes came from the north, the Jews called him the king of the north, attacked the sanctuary, defiled it, set up an image in it, poured swine's broth over the holy things, compelled the Jews to receive a mark. Maccabees tells you about that. Slaughtered 40,000 that wouldn't. And for 2,300 days, the sanctuary service is interrupted. About half that number, intense persecution. Then some of the loyal Jews, loyal to God, get together and they overcome these forces. They cleanse the temple and that was the beginning of the celebration of Hanukkah, which Jesus attended. Hebrews, uh, John 10, verse 22. Jesus attended that. If you have a Bible commentary, Jamison, Forsman, and Brown, which is one of the best you can get today. I mentioned Wordsworth. That's very hard to get, though so it's the best. Christopher Wordsworth. But if you have a Jamison, Forston and Brown commentary, it says Revelation 13 is based on what happened in that terrible crisis under Antiochus Epiphanes when the Jews were forced to receive a mark or die. So does the Bible foretell a last great crisis? It certainly does. Chapter 3 foretold it. Chapter 7, 11 described it. Chapter 7 alludes to it. 13 is the most comprehensive description. And we will come back and talk about it, what it means at a later date. So, just reviewing this central point. For a hermeneutic for Revelation, we remember that every Bible book made sense to the people that first got it. So we're not meant to suddenly read Joseph Stalin and Adolf Hitler and tanks and atomic bombs and all that in the book of Revelation. It made sense to the people that first got it. But it is a symbolic book. It's an apocalypse, which is noted for strange symbolism. We don't see beasts with seven heads unless we've been unwise in our consumption the night before. Symbols, see? Most of the symbols are found in the Old Testament and they're Jewish. But once they hit Revelation, they apply to the Christian church experience because the Bible says he's not a Jew which is one inwardly, he's a Jew which is one outwardly. Uh, not a Jew which is one outwardly, he's a Jew which is one inwardly, whose circumcision is of the heart, not of the flesh. That's Romans 2, 28 and 29. And the last verse of Galatians 3 says, If you're Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now, there is good news. More Jews have been converted to Christ in the last 15 years than the previous 2,000. Christ died for every Jew. But this book warns against twice as has this warning. Beware of those who say they are Jews and are not. Revelation 2.9, Revelation 3.9. Beware of those who say they are Jews and are not. The New Testament only recognizes now as a true Jew Someone committed to Christ. If you are Christ, 
Then A, Abraham, seed. Romans 9, 6 says, The children of the flesh are not the children of the promise. Concerning them, Thessalonians says, Wrath has come upon them to the othermost. Christ said about them, Your house is left unto you desolate. The kingdom is taken from you. We are given to a people who bring forth the fruits thereof. Christian church. You see. So, the book of Revelation had to make sense. The people that first got it, they saw Antichrist as a Roman Empire. We'll see later fulfilments. It's symbolism. It's symbolism that applies to the Christian church and is now on a worldwide scale. But what we've been saying the last 20 minutes is the main key is Christ. The revelation of Jesus Christ, that's the first breath of the book. It's about him and it's from him and he's the key to it. His experience and his teachings. We notice how his experience, you know, our Lord lived about 33 years and then died. Why did he die 33? Wouldn't it have been wonderful if he could have preached till he's the age of Methuselah? No, after the early 30s, we begin to die. He had to be a perfect offering. He had to die before his body began to go downhill. Now, we talk about middle ages 40, but since when have two 40s made 70? Middle life is not 40. Middle age is about 30 to 35. Any time after 33, the human body begins to degenerate at the rate of 1% a year in every area. Seeing, hearing, the heart, the muscle, capacity to digest, capacity to run. After 33, you go downhill in every area at 1% a year. So our Lord dies at 33 because he's then at the peak of his manhood before he begins to go downhill. He had to be a perfect offering. He ministers for 1260 days or to use the symbolism of Revelation, 42 months. That's how many stations there were for Israel between Sinai and Canaan. 42 stopping places. Three and a half years is a broken seven. Always represents trial, tribulation, testing. So Christ has a ministry of three and a half years of trial and trouble and testing. Then he is cut off the darkness, resurrection. So in this book, Christ and Antichrist, that symbolism reoccurs. So his life is a key to this book, but his teachings are a key to this book. And we talked about the Olivet Sermon and that Olivet Sermon, in foretelling the future, said that the tribulation awaiting him would at the end time before the true Christians. It is perfectly biblical that there is coming a terrible time of trouble. And as we find that difficult to believe because we live in times of peace, you just have to look back about history. And people do terrible things under threat. You imagine... In the Korean War, about most, which most of us know very little, in the Korean War, when the UNO forces bombed North Korea, they murdered by bombs two million people, most of whom were women and children. And these are the goodies. When the Russians went into Afghanistan, they not only wiped out cities and villages, but when they came across family groups, they put them together and burnt them to death, including the children. Why? Oh, they said that kids, with their knives, torture our wounded soldiers. See, we do terrible things in time of stress. Australians do it. Not just the Germans, not just the Russians. Given the right circumstances, any of us are capable of any sin. If you've had a good night's sleep, and you've had a good breakfast, you can't possibly believe that. But become an insomniac for a week and be hungry, and you'll believe it. Can you imagine a jar of water that has an inch of sediment of dirt at the bottom that's been on a, a shelf for a week? The water looks drinkable. Give it a shaking. It no longer looks drinkable. You and I are very respectable. Why? We haven't been shaken enough. <laughs> Give us a shaking. We're capable of murder. See? So when the Bible foretells that in the last days there'll be a great tribulation, let's not be too sceptical about that. This thing has happened in miniature over and over again. 
Read the story of the French Revolution. Read the story of the Bolshevik, the Communist Revolution. Read the fears that agitated America after World War II. Read the fears at the beginning of World War II. See? Nothing wrong with the American nature. It's not wrong with my, my nature. Human nature is full of fears without God. But the wonderful thing, of course, in this book is when you come to the end of Revelation, I see a new heavens and a new earth and God wipes away all tears and there's no more death, neither sorrow nor sighing for the former things are passed away. I see a great river of life and the throne of God, again symbolism, and the tree of life for the healing of the nations and there's no night there. The Lord God and the Lamb are the light thereof. You know, nature tries to teach us things. The humble caterpillar becomes the beautiful butterfly, but first into a chrysalis, like a tomb. The Australian cicada, many of them down there for 17 years. And then you remember Lyndon by the college, what the row they would make when they'd come up after 17 years in the joy of resurrection. Many beautiful flowers come from horrible looking brown bulbs that look dead. Beautiful flowers emerge from them. I never knew the seasons much so I went to America because I was born in Townsville <coughs> where there's only one season. <laughs> I lived in Michigan for about 18 months and uh, Lynn was there. And every day the sky seemed grey for months on end and dull. But you know, every winter is replaced by spring. Things seem worse at night, don't they? Never, never take seriously your, your no worries in the night. They're always exaggerated at night time. As soon as the sun rises, a lot of them will flee away. See? So what am I saying? God has parables of what this book is teaching. God has parables in nature. Night gives way to morning. Darkness gives way to light. The caterpillar becomes a beautiful butterfly. Winter gives way to spring. Death gives way to resurrection. The things of this life are not the end. If they were, I doubt it would be worth living. The universe was set going in the first place, not so you and I could live three score years and ten with all the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, all the whips and scorns of time, but we're here to prepare us for eternity. And this book is about eternity. And I want to leave you with one verse. Would you look at the first chapter of it and the fifth verse? From Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Notice, he loved us before he washed us. Some of your translations will differ a little bit in the wording, but the same thought is there. He loved us before he cleansed us. This man receiveth sinners. The greatest mistake of people who hear the gospel is, they think, well, if I was better... I could go to church. If I was better, I could become a Christian. No, no, no. You come just as you are. You come just as you are. He loved us while we're dirty. And him that loved us and then washed us. You come just as you are. The blind came as blind. The deaf came as deaf. The lepers came as lepers. We come just as we are. We never wait to try and clean, clean things up. Think with me for a moment on Barabbas. He's in prison. He's murdered men. He's been very violent. Nobody is safe near Barabbas. Suddenly a soldier walks in and says, you can go now. What do you mean I can go? I thought I was to go to the cross. No, another man's taken your place. Ha! Don't believe that. You're pulling my leg. You're making things worse for me. Trying to excite hope where there's no hope. No, it's true. Another man called Jesus has taken your place. And Barabbas' eyes open wide. He hears the story. Or he says, I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough for that man to take my place. I've been a murderer and a thief 
and violent and a liar. I'm not good enough for that man to take my life. I'm staying here. I'll get better in prison, then I'll go out. Wouldn't he have been stupid? But when we proclaim the gospel today, lots of people think, well, when I overcome this bad habit, when I overcome that bad habit, when I make this right, then I'll come. No, no. Under him that loved us and washed us, this man received the sinners. He's gone to be guest with him that's a sinner. We come just as we are. His love is so great, he accepts us just as we are. But he loves us too much to leave us just as we are. We do the coming, he does the watching, the washing, and the keeping. When I had just become a Christian, I can remember as clear as day, walking the underground in Sydney, thinking, well, I don't know whether I'll hold out on this business. You know, I, I don't think I can keep going. And then it occurred to me from something I'd read, if we do the coming, he'll do the keeping. He loved us while we were dirty. He loves us despite our weaknesses, our infirmities and our failures, which are many more than you and I could ever guess. He loves us nonetheless. So Christian experience is coming just as we are. And we have to repeat that coming many times because we all make many mistakes. We never graduate from the school of error. We should speedily graduate from wantonly, willfully chosen, pursued error. Yes. But we never graduate from the school of failure. But we're accepted in the beloved and we're complete in him if we trust in the blood of Christ. His death for us. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this wonderful book that tells us of your love and your mercy, that warns us about the future and tells us how to prepare for it. Grant us your benediction in coming days that we may trust and obey and find our heaven here on earth until your coming. Amen.